So, welcome everyone to the fifth episode of Interop Talk, live and in person here at HIMSS 23. I'm joined by Stephen Lane, Chief Medical Officer at Health Gorilla and former Clinical Informatics and Interoperability Lead at Sutter Health. My name is Dave Castle. I'm the Chief Customer Officer here at Health Gorilla and former Executive Director of Care Equality. We're also joined, as always, by Devin McGraw, Data Sharing Lead at Invite and former Deputy Director for Health Information Privacy at HHS, and by Zoe Barber, Policy Director at the Sequoia Project. And special thanks to Zoe for, for joining us here at HEMS. We'll work out the microphones eventually here. One of the perils of being alive and in person. But just to start out, obviously, we are here at the HIMSS conference, and the conference tends to have a certain buzz or hot topic. What are we feeling is the hot topic out of this year's conference? I know I've heard as candidates, possibly TEFCO, which is obviously near and dear here, AI, but anything else, other dark horse candidates? What do you all think? Sure, I can start. Okay, there we go. It's working. <laughs> And yes, TEFCA is very hot right now. Definitely hearing a lot of buzz about TEFCA and also about the new ONC notice of proposed rulemaking to update information blocking and certification. Uh, but one of the topics that I have been hearing a lot about recently is just this continued buzz around health equity and the idea of health equity by design. And I think the federal agencies, CMS, ONC, have really made a concerted effort and it's been really intentional in the past few years about incorporating social determinants of health into their their regulations to really support that more whole patient care. And that was also really evident in the rules that were released last week, or the proposed rules that I'm sure we'll talk about a little bit more in terms of trying to increase the data that's captured, collected, exchange that contributes to understanding the full characteristics of a patient's health and their outcomes. Another point that's come up, certainly in the interoperability discussions, is this transition that we made from not having enough interoperability to having so much interoperability that it's challenging for recipients of data to know how to manage it all. And more folks coming forward trying to look at questions of the data quality and the data completeness and how to improve that to make things, make exchange data into workflows. No. It's interesting. I think there's there may be too much interoperability in some pockets of the ecosystem, but we still struggle around patient access to data. It's still not seamless. There's still a lot of kludginess. It is not necessarily a theme that I've heard at this conference, but I feel like it's a theme of prior conferences, and I worry a little bit that people think it's a solved issue when it's really not. There's still lots and lots of ways that patients struggle to get their data in an easy way. It's an interesting point. I wonder myself and, and worry that it's not so much that people think it's a solved issue as that they've thrown their hands in the air. But we did actually, one of the moments that has stood out for me at the conference so far was actually at the pre-conference symposium, the HIE symposium, where I believe it was Grace Cordovano made a statement about how the education system in the U.S. should prepare students to become patients and navigate the U.S. healthcare system. And it really struck me as something that on the one hand, I think, wow, okay, that's maybe a good idea. And on the other hand, it's absolutely appalling that we think we need to teach our high school students before they escape from our clutches how to navigate the U.S. healthcare system. So I guess, what, what is your reaction to that? Yeah, I would wonder what it is that we would teach them because how do you navigate the U.S. healthcare system? I think that one thing that we could very well teach in high school it's for adolescents is about data privacy and about their right to receive private health care and how to protect their privacy. That's something that providers end up talking to adolescents about in the office or on the phone, et cetera. But I think it's an intriguing idea. Certainly we have health classes for kids. Part of health is now digital health. Part of health is now integrating with health care. So I think it could be fit into that sort of a curriculum and no, no one better than Grace to, to push that forward. You know, I think it's so fun. We'd say that about a lot of things, right? It'd be great if we learned how to do our taxes or how to maintain our house. <laughs> Wait, my, my son is a senior in high school and he's actually taking the class on like <laughs> basic citizenship and registering to vote and things like that. We do try to teach those things, but yeah, I, actually I like the idea of health class. I hadn't really even thought of that. Well, 
even, again, like a basic life skills class should also include like how to take care of yourself, which includes what it means to navigate the healthcare system. What is health insurance? What is health insurance? How do you get it? How do you make sure you keep it? What kinds of things should you be doing to pursue the best prevention strategies? And where does your data fit into that? We're talking about digital natives, kids who are used to doing everything on their phones. We're gearing, we're getting the healthcare system to the point where healthcare is also something that you do on your phone, but we're not quite there yet. I love the fact that you mentioned balancing your checkbook, right? Wait, what's a checkbook? These kids have never even seen a checkbook. But the idea of managing safely and effectively your digital data, again, I'll take that class. I'll go back and TA that class. You know, but there's a nice touch point here with what you were saying, Devin, about the challenges that individuals have today getting their data, using their data, sharing their data. And I think that, I think that also touches on the point about TEFCA. Where are we going with TEFCA and how are we able to leverage the individual access services purpose of use that's going to be in the first iteration of TEFCA to improve on the current situation where patients are so challenged in getting their data. With the pandemic, the, how the increased use of telehealth may have, could it, did it increase access, did it increase quality outcomes, especially for people with chronic conditions? And there was an interesting report released, I think it was last week, it was the, the Medicare Payer Advisory Council, and they did a study on the impact of telehealth during the pandemic on better access, increased quality, or improved outcomes, and lower Lower costs and with admittedly muddled data from the pandemic, they the underlying data suggested that there may have been an increase in access for some populations, but that the data did not suggest that led to any kind of increase in quality outcomes or reduction in costs, which I find that very interesting because for me as a patient with chronic conditions, that's how I've had to navigate the, the health system my whole life, and I see doctors very regularly having that access to telehealth was extremely helpful for me in terms of taking care of myself during the pandemic. I think as a telehealth provider myself, I, I think that we saw a skewed population seeking telehealth during the meat of the pandemic. A lot of people with respiratory illness, chronic conditions that couldn't go unfollowed, but general primary and preventive care really was much more difficult to do via telehealth during that. So I think that there, it's gonna be difficult to interpret that data. I think now that we're settling into a new normal of integrating telehealth into routine services, we'll probably see something else come out over the next few years. I've not seen that MedPAC report, but it feels to me that they looked at too short of a window to measure outcomes around telehealth. You really need to give a little bit more time, and I think you're absolutely right. Rather than looking at the numbers from a big picture perspective to dive into certain conditions where people were more likely to actually have access to telehealth services during the pandemic and see what impact that had on their care long term and how do you measure like the people who got a service versus the ones who didn't i think that's it's a complicated picture the other challenge with telehealth of course relates back to interoperability which is telehealth is so often performed by providers other than the core care team where people are seeking acute care telehealth respiratory illnesses etc and i think that oftentimes that care is not fully informed by a complete picture of an individual's health information. So it's been less coordinated, more disjointed. It hasn't always come back into a longitudinal patient record. So I think as we address the interoperability challenges, as we have the TEFCA framework, et cetera, and we have better tools, we will see naturally telehealth become both more effective and more integrated into general care. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I think in, intuitively, it just makes sense that telehealth, as a part of a larger sh cultural shift in healthcare towards better generalized access, less, less being tied to the brick and mortar facilities, 24 seven access into services driven by technology in, and the internet is really going to be a game changer. And I think it gets back to that larger point that was behind Grace's statement about education and how do you navigate the healthcare system. And I think getting back to the IAS topic, that 
To me, that really is the promise of individual access. It's not to diminish the fact that you want to sometimes have access to your records for their own sake and compile them and be able to do some interesting things with them, but really, I see it as a, a way of driving workflows where we can make the patient part of the workflow and at the same time provide them with tools that make it much easier to actually navigate the healthcare system. Yeah, I agree. Coming back to the equity question, I think one of the downstream benefits of individual access, it, it's not only collecting the data that does exist, but it's being becoming aware of the data that doesn't exist. Care gaps, in particular. We know that people who get less care overall tend to get less preventative care and tend not to have the, receive the services that they need. So I think as we make individual access available, more prevalent, as we drive that into populations that have not received good quality care or adequate care in the past, I think there's a real opportunity to highlight within communities. Breast cancer screening in your community is lagging. Let's have a campaign, colon cancer screening, what have you, STD prevention. I think there's a real opportunity by empowering, again, going back to the young people, for teaching kids as adolescents about how to navigate the health system. Part of that is how to know what you should be doing to keep yourself healthy. And individual access could really support that. I just one of the many things I love about Health Gorilla is that I actually don't have to bring up the individual access topic because you guys are so devoted to it, which is just, I see that same vision, right? I'm not suggesting that patients be the pack, pack mules of their own data and be the only way that data moves from point A to point B, but you already know, you already know and it, patients will look for solutions themselves in addition to seeking care from a medical provider, how many people look online, join advocacy groups, try to figure out what they should do next, right? And when you're armed with your data, then other tools can be made available to you to enable you to make better choices, to enable you to understand a little bit better about what's going on with your condition, to empower a caregiver or two or three or many, however many, a team to help you in addition to helping your doctor treat you better. Like the, the potential is just so obvious to me. And yet we have a, some angst, not we, I don't think any of us do, but there is angst out there about, about doing this. There are reasons for that and we're trying to address them. But that vision to me is just is so compelling that it just sometimes baffles me why we're not all running in that direction as quickly as we can. I, I, indeed, I, I, won't, I won't try to elaborate on that. But one of the promises of the Tefka ecosystem is a bit of an unlock there, if you will, with patient access. At least that's certainly a hope that many of us have. But patient access isn't the only unlock that we're trying to achieve. There's also a need to get a lot more progress made in terms of interoperability for payment and operations purposes, which are permitted under HIPAA but really have lagged far behind treatment-based exchange. And some lag there is probably appropriate. Treatment is obviously very important, but at the same time, there's a lot of efficiency gains that we could achieve through interoperability in the payment and operations space. Oh, Steven's chopping at the bit. But actually, can we start with Zoe on this one for where the RC? Well, I just wanted to add a little context to what you said is all before, before Zoe goes. And that is, it's not that data is not moving for payment and healthcare operations purposes. Uh, it's being exchanged. It's being, quote, interoperated, but not efficiently and often not even digitally, which is why it's such a drag on our healthcare system, increasing costs and burdens. Yeah, often being exchanged in the most manual, labor-intensive, least efficient way possible. But, so the, this is certainly something that ONC and the RCE are aware of, and acknowledging you're not speaking for either ONC or the RCE here. But, but what can you share about the progress that's being made on payment and operations? Yeah, sure. And yeah, I'll say that over and over again. I'm just speaking for myself, not the RCE or ONC. For the past almost a year now, I think we really started digging in back in last summer. The Trusted Exchange Framework and Common Agreement, the TEFCA, authorizes six exchange purposes for exchange under the current version, which is version one. And individuals or entities in TEFCA are allowed to request data from anyone else in TEFCA for these six purposes. Treatment, payment, healthcare operations, individual access services, government benefits determination, and public health. 
Now, to start off with, only two of those exchange purposes actually require a response. Anybody can initiate for those purposes, but for if it's not treatment or individual access, then there's no requirement under the common agreement that a data source respond to that request. So what we're trying to do is slowly and incrementally expand the required use cases under the TEFCA and the required responses to really try to move the needle and drive exchange beyond the treatment use cases. And so the payment and healthcare operations, for those use cases, what we're starting to do is trying to narrow the scope of those a little bit to make them a little bit more accessible, a little bit more palatable. Right now, the definitions in the common agreement are extremely broad and they relate back to the definitions under HIPAA, which if if you've read those definitions, they're very broad, they can be very ambiguous. There are multiple bullet points under each one of those definitions, different categories. There are different rules that apply to the different categories of the definitions. And so we're trying to scope that down and say, okay, we're going to focus on this set of use cases that has a high clinical impact. And the intention is to then put parameters around that and say, okay, this is what's needed in a request and this is what's needed in a response in order to promote comfort and transparency in responding to those requests and also to make sure that the right data is being exchanged. So we've scoped those down for healthcare operations. We're tackling kind of the first paragraph under the definition of operations in HIPAA and for payment we're tackling the risk adjustment use case. Under payment. I'll ask a naive question here and yeah, yeah, let's go here. So you use the word un unpalatable. <laughs> what is unpalatable? Why is this so controversial? So for, I think for healthcare operations specifically, there, there needs to be, so for example, under HIPAA, there's different requirements such that if you're, if you're requesting data under healthcare operations, you could be requesting for a clinical use case like care coordination, or you could be requesting for marketing. Covered entities, it provides a lot more comfort to them to know that the request is coming in for that purpose and so that they know that they're authorized to respond for that purpose. Yeah, no. So you got it exactly right. You know, there, there may be eight different categories of healthcare operations, but there's a limit to the ability to share to, from one entity to another for that other entity's healthcare operations. It's limited to only those that are a little bit more clinically related. And I could see an issue where an entity, but it's always comes down to trust, right? What is the recipient entity going to be doing with this data? And treatment, I can get my arms wrapped around because of course nobody wants to be an obstacle to sharing data for treatment purposes. For individual access, we're already required under HIPAA for the most part to provide data to patients. And who's gonna go out and publicly say that they're anti-patient access to data? But payment and operations is a sort of different kettle of fish, I think, and there's always, like been, I think, a long history of entities being very nervous about sharing data with payers that they will ask for and receive too much, that it'll end up getting, they'll end up having a price to pay in terms of their own interactions with these payers. And then similarly on operations, the category still looks too big and nebulous. So I actually applaud you all for thinking through like, all right, let's take little bites out of this and, and focus on some use cases that might be a little bit more comfortable for folks and then move from there. I think that's great. I have had observations about how you guys, or how the RCE, not you personally, are, is approaching this, and that is this notion that for payment and healthcare operations, and I would anticipate we may see this with other purposes of use as well, that the initial SOPs are really very voluntary. The responses remain voluntary. With this caveat that when TEFCA evolves to support fire exchange, that will change. So it seems to me that the main value of fire exchange is that you're looking at more restricted data. You're looking at more of an ability to address the minimum necessary component of the, what is being exchanged, but it doesn't address this issue of repurposing the data or using it for other purposes. So it seems that those who might be anxious about responding today to payment and healthcare operations queries won't be necessarily that much more enthusiastic doing it under fire. Talk about that. What, how do we see FIRE as transitioning us to a next iteration of TEFCA that will create enthusiasm in the marketplace? 
Yeah, I think that's a really good question, and, and you hear it all the time, like, should, we should just wait for fire. And I think it's clear I mean, that fire can has the promise and will provide a lot more efficiencies in how health information is exchanged. But like you said, it's not, it's not going to solve all of our problems. So I think, yes, it has a lot of potential for minimum necessary. That's one that it's really hard today to make any kind of argument around minimum necessary when we find it's largely the same clinical documents that are being exchanged for all of these exchange purposes, but FIRE will let you get more granular. But it's not going to change the ambiguity or the difference of interpretations around applicable law. And that's where we really need more clarification. I hate to say it because I used to, I worked for a federal agency. I worked for ONC. I I was a regulator and I understand how frustrating that can be. But the truth is we really need the regulators in the room to help make these regulations work for us and push the needle on exchange. I used to say when I was at OCR that there's a role for the federal government to play in actively stewarding those regulations so that they are heading in the same direction as other federal initiatives. That First of all, they can't be ossified in stone as though they're not something that it could ever be touched. And second, the world is changing. And these same regulations that worked perfectly well in 2002, or worked reasonably well in 2002, are not going to work as well in a new dynamic, and how do we shift that? Even the concept of minimum necessary, while important part of fair information practices, it just breaks down, even if you have tech more greater technical capabilities to honor it, because the people asking you for data will always ask you for all that they think they are going to need, and you are going to be pressed to share that with them in order to be paid, in order to make sure that you're not violating information blocking rules because a request has come in. That dynamic is really hard. And if the regulators, I agree with you, were more at the table, I mean, it would help for them, OCR in particular, um, office I used to work for, terribly under-resourced. Terribly under-resourced. If they had more people to come to conversations, be able to contribute, be able to be a little bit more nimble, I think we would all be advantaged. It would be really nice if we had some way to pull them into the room. Uh, In a lot of these rooms where we've been sitting recently talking about TEFCA, you've got great representation from multiple agencies across HHS. HHS is incredibly enthusiastic about supporting TEFCA and looking for opportunities for NIH, for CDC, for FDA, but OCR has been notably absent. Yeah. Pulling them into the room, I think they would come, actually. They might not say anything. They are also a law enforcement agency. So they there is this kind of push and pull dynamic where they want to be part of those conversations, but they have, because of their law enforcement purview as well as their policy purview, they have to have some time to consider what is this going to do for my enforcement capabilities. And so it's less you're less able to opine in the moment to say, oh, we can do, it just, it's a a little bit of a slower cycle. That was my experience. I think there's also a tension that comes up a lot between what the authorities and the scope that the federal regulators actually have to impose regulations. And we have to remember that they're making regulations that will meet the needs of the entire country. And we all know how much variation there is across states, states' laws, as well as the just differing needs of the communities within the industry. And so they have to set that policy at a high level to try to really encompass that variation and then let the industry, the community, come to those more granular details of how to move things along. And I think that tension spills over into TEFCA because TEFCA, while it's not a federal regulation, it is a federal policy. And so there is still that that bar of the intention of TEFCA is to set that broad policy so there can be that broad level of that the kind of blunter object object, right? Like the pipe between the networks and then without disrupting the more granular exchange that's happening at the industry level and within the networks and the different ways that people are doing things. Yeah, I, and I think the big takeaway there is it's complicated. But so it, it, understood with respect to the, 
the challenges and potential limitations and considerations that OCR might have in putting clarifications out there for HIPAA, do we have an opportunity in the TEFCA community to say, okay, there, there are guardrails that are set by applicable law. This is what HIPAA states. We believe that we need to get a little bit more specific. As long as we stay within those guardrails, might there be an opportunity to establish what we believe more clear definitions might be, and then even maybe get OCR to say, not that's the definitive interpretation, but that interpretation at least gets a thumbs up, it's okay, it is, falls within the law. Well, that's the promise of TEFCA, right? You tell me, you got, you've been doing this longer than me, you are all there at the start of care equality. Is, do you see a significant difference between the government engagement and the willingness to have a role in that policy making on the ground? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It, the government did not get involved at all in, in care equality. And there, I think there were a number of reasons for that. And I think some of it was a lack of understanding on the government's part. Some of it also, I think, was a hesitation around purely com private sector initiatives and whether there were unseen commercial interests there, whether there were competitive interests there that the government didn't want to get itself entangled in. And I think a lot of that ended up being resolved around care equality. But to answer your question, absolutely, there, there's a fundamental difference in the role that the government is playing in TEFCA and what it has played previously. If we can maybe drill down onto a case in point, there's now, a, since last week's announcements, there's a, a potential touch point between TEFCA and information blocking, which I think is the second potential incentive that's been floated by the government to help move people into TEFCA. And Zoe, I was sharing with you earlier, I don't quite get it. I've read it a couple times now. Can you help clarify how does this information blocking exception related to TEFCA exchange work? Yeah, let's get into it. Again, I was on the beach last week when <laughs> two or three of the more significant regulations of the year that impact the work that I do came out. Please excuse me. But I want to just talk about uh, two proposed rules that came out last week. And these are both the ones that, that relate to TEFCA. So the first is the CMS, they have their annual payment rule. This is the rule that sets the reimbursement rates for Medicare participating hospitals. And within that annual rule, there's the Promoting Interoperability Program for Medicare Hospitals that was formerly, formerly Meaningful Use. And of course, there's a complementary sister payment rule that also relates back to the eligible clinicians, the outpatient. Um, so one of the objectives under Promoting Interoperability is to reward hospitals for engaging in health information exchange. And over the past couple of years, CMS has been adding these optional alternative ways to claim credit for the health information objective. So you can attest and say, I participate in a health information exchange for bi-directional exchange and claim credit for this objective. They first, they added that, the health information exchange measure, and then they added another alternative to that, which is you can say that you participate in TEFCA specifically for bi-directional exchange and claim credit for that measure. Now, won't get into it too much, but for those paying attention, TEFCA is, by definition, a health information exchange or network. So that was already covered under the first alternative that they offered. They didn't necessarily need to call it out. It still would have been true. So I call it like regulatory signaling. They, <laughs> there's no actual new incentive there, but by calling it out by name, it brings it to the forefront. And ONC took a somewhat similar approach in their proposed rules. Again, ONC, this is the agency, they run the federal, the health IT certification program, develop policies for information blocking and for the trusted exchange framework and common agreement. And so they released a follow up to the rule that, the, that they released back in 2020, which was the Cures Act rule and it included the updates to health IT certification and the information blocking exceptions. Can I ask first. you specifically, because I've only read it once and the way that I, the way, you tell me if I'm wrong, because I very well might be. The way that I read it is 
you don't have to satisfy some of the other exceptions that, that exist, the other safe harbors around fees, around licensing, maybe even infeasibility. I don't know. There's just a number of exceptions where you don't have to go to those criteria. If you're using TEFCA to exchange, you don't have to meet those exceptions. We consider you to not only not be information blocking, but you don't have to meet the fee limitations. You don't have to meet, did I read that right? Yeah, so the content and manner exception, the way that it's written today, it, so the manner exception, it essentially it has these two tiers, right? So it says, if you're gonna, this is how you should exchange data. First and foremost, you should send it in the way, the manner that it was requested. Right, that's, that's the first and foremost. But it also says as part of that first tier, the manner requested or if you can come to agreeable terms. And that's the agreeable terms is what I wanna highlight, right? And then if you can't satisfy that first tier, so if you're technically unable to send it in the manner requested or you can't come to agreeable terms, then you move down to the second tier, which is the alternative manner, and then there are a whole bunch more tiers within the alternative manner for the progression of how you satisfy. So what ONC is saying is that if you have both a requester and a responder, okay, so Zoe Barber organization participates in TEFCA and requests data from Dave Castle Health System, and we are both in TEFCA, we have both agreed to the terms under TEFCA, then even if I request data from Dave Castle Health System and I say, I actually want it outside of TEFCA, I want it via Fire API, not through TEFCA, Dave Castle Health System can say, actually, we're going to fulfill the request through TEFCA because we both participate in TEFCA and I don't have to, even if you don't want that, I don't have to offer it in any other way. And that's actually a really helpful example and extending that a little bit. So let's suppose the Zoe Barber organization does participate in TEFCA, but I do not yet. And I come to you with some request for information that would in fact be available via the TEFCA exchange. Can you tell me, no, I won't give that to you in the manner requested. You need to get it from me via TEFCA? No, the, and I think that's key. Because they're aligning with those tiers in the manner exception. So because the agreeable terms, which is what they're, that's the whole underlying notion behind this whole TEFCA exception is it's an agreeable term. That's part of the first tier. And if you'll remember, as part of that first tier, if you can offer the data in the manner requested, then you don't have to abide by the fee exception. You don't have to abide by the licensing exception. Yeah. And so the, the question that has occurred to me, of course, my brain always goes to individual access. In the fee exception, there is a very clear provision that says you cannot charge for individual access if the manner in which the EHI is being delivered is through some mechanism that's, <clears throat> excuse me, internet-based and doesn't require any manual labor to assemble. And so if you get a free pass on the manner exception where you're exchanging IAS through TEFCA, where does that fee exception go if it's tossed out? Where does that fee provision around individual access go if it's tossed out the window? It's, it, it essentially, is ONC saying, TEFCA entities can charge for stuff, which they've already said. I think we've always interpreted that to mean, well, except if it's individual access. In my opinion, I might have missed something, but that the whole manner exception and the, this sort of treating it like, oh, this is the manner requested and all those fee exception requirements go out the window, what happens to those restrictions on individual access? I don't know. I don't know, it's a really good question. The thing that strikes me is coming to agreeable terms via TEFCA is the same as coming to agreeable terms via an HIE or carry quality or there, there are so many examples of when entities can come to agreeable terms. And I think to limit it to say it's just, it's only TEFCA, we, this just applies to TEFCA. First of all, TEFCA is exchange between two QHINs, right? It's only TEFCA-based exchange if it's going between two QHINs. So any exchange that's happening within a network is not TEFCA-based exchange. And so I think this rule is, the, the proposed rule, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily address all of that exchange that's happening with the network. So if you have two entities that are both participating under Health Gorilla, any exchange that's happening within there, that's not TEFCA exchange. So just to clarify on that though, if, 
it, it, somebody who's participating under Health Gorilla and somebody who's participating under Commonwealth, say, even though they, the two entities themselves are not QHINs, if the means by which they are able to connect from Health Gorilla to Commonwealth is TEFCA, wouldn't that still be TEFCA-based exchange? Yeah. Maybe there's a clarification that, that, that would be helpful there in, in the rule, actually. Well, yeah, and I think they need to absolutely, I think they need to address that big gap because it, that condition just wouldn't apply if you're part of the same QHIN as the entity that you're trying to exchange with. Even though they've come, you've, everybody who's participating under Health Gorilla has presumably come to agreeable terms via the Health Gorilla network agreement, whatever that is, this condition doesn't seem to cover that. De Devin, I'm curious, was your read of the NPRM, did you get a suggestion that it would allow charging of fees for individual access where it didn't before? That was my initial read, but actually after Zoe's explanation that it really would apply any time that you're, you get out of the fee exception any time that you are exchanging data in the manner requested, whether it's through TEFCA or any other network, that was like a light bulb moment for me. I'm like, oh, so maybe there already was a gigantic exception to the exception that I hadn't thought about. So yeah. I've gotten the high sign that we only have a couple of minutes left. What closing thoughts, any, anything that you want to leave the audience with here today? I'm certainly excited by all of the discussion of TEFCA, both, both here amongst us and in the meeting as a whole. I think there's a lot of movement happening. There's a lot of alignment occurring within the industry. I think a lot of the thorny questions are being highlighted, and hopefully the RCE is taking those all to heart as you work on the current OPs and the new ones yet to come. But I think we're seeing things moving down the track, which is exciting. Yeah. I'm actually pretty excited about TEFCA, always has, have been, and I think the more incentives that exist for entities to join and use this network, the better, because ultimately, again, it only works well if everybody dives into the pool, and so the addition of use cases, including payment and operations, frankly, will make individual access work better. So this is all very, these are welcome developments, and I would encourage the community to really support them and push on them and to provide support to the RCE and trying to navigate how we get the, those pathways to move forward so that, again, more people can get in the pool. Yeah, and I should probably mention, or otherwise my chief legal counsel would be mad at me, please visit the RCE website, rce at sequoiaproject.org, and take a look at the proposed policies and the common agreement that we have up there, provide feedback. We really take into consideration all of the feedback that we have. And it's just been such a pleasure to be part of this TEFCA community. And I was saying to these guys earlier, especially now that there's all this excitement and buzz because we have the first applicants that are going through the process and now we actually have this, this community that we can go to, that I can learn from and go to for advice. So personally, for me, that's been really exciting. Let me sneak in one more, which is another please, which is please also review the uh, ONC's NPRM that was posted to the Federal Register yesterday. 60 days are now ticking for public comment on that. All right, with that, time is up. Officially, I got the red sign saying time is up. But huge thank you to the panel, and thanks to those who've been listening in here live. And uh, we'll see you again for the next episode.